Hello, welcome back. Uh, this is episode 2 of my tutorial series on using Multimedia Fusion and the Lacewing extension to create online applications and multiplayer games. Now, the last episode we created the simplest of Lacewing applications, the chat room, uh, but now we're actually going to make a game which is far more interesting. Uh, the game will be a rough prototype or a multiplayer top down shooter, uh, nothing fancy, but it should give you an idea of how multiplayer movements should be constructed. Now. I didn't want to record half an hour of me creating objects and writing events that just have nothing to do with Lacewing, so what I'm looking at right now is an empty template that we, we are going to fill. Uh, you can download it from the link in the video description or in the thread on the ClickTeam forums. So to open it you'll need the uh, Lacewing extension uh, but also the string tokenizer extension which you can find at AccuArtisoft.com on the downloads page uh, down here. There you go install that and we should be ready to go. So let me take you through what I've got going on in these three frames. In the first frame, pretty familiar if you followed episode one, the user can type their name in and connect and there are no events in here yet. Uh, frame two, I thought it would be cool to have one of those game lists that online games have where you can browse for the match you want to play. Uh, we've got some uh, buttons for refreshing the, uh, the list, joining the game and also an edit box and a button to create games as well. Uh, there was, I think, just one event in the event editor, so yes, uh, start of frame, we just set the text in the game name box to enter game now. I didn't really want to uh, leave that blank. The third and final frame has a bit more going on. Um, this is our match frame, so alongside lace swing there is the string tokenizer object we needed. Uh, there was also two actives. Um, one of them is uh, self and one of them is called peer. So. Um, the self will represent the local player and the peer object will represent all the other players. Uh, at the uh, bottom here there's a string that will help us debug the messages that we'll be sending later. Um, oh, the, uh, the self object has two alterable values, uh, one of them is the x-speed and the other one is called y-speed. We use these to control the speed. Uh, what a surprise. Um, uh, same with the peer object except there's also an extra value for the peer ID and um, another alterable string for the peer name. We might use that uh, later on. Uh, in the events for frame 3 there's actually quite a lot going on. Uh, luckily you don't need to worry about uh, any of it. Um, it's all for the player movement. Um, the movement is the simplest eight directional uh, movement that you, you can imagine. There's no acceleration, there's no deceleration, no speed correction for the diagonal uh, directions and there's not even any collisions. Um, I've stripped it back to really keep things simple. So that's what it looks like. Uh, all we do is, uh, depending on the key combination pressed, we set the x speed and the y speed and the the, uh, the direction. Uh, and we also set the x uh, position and the y position accordingly. We also do the same thing for uh, the peer object, setting the x and the y position. That is, we're not we're not actually setting the x speed and the y speed at all. All these events are doing are just setting the uh, the direction. We'll be setting the x speed and the y speed of the peer object um, a little bit later on. So uh, pause the video, take a look around, get comfortable with the objects and <laughs> the events of uh, cobbled together. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start adding in some events for frame one. Very similar to what you had going on in the uh, first episode when the user presses enter and when the length of the username box is greater than zero then we want to connect to our server. What, connect to, uh, what server are we going to uh, connect to? Well, we're not going to connect to a public server, and not not in this episode. Uh, if you've still got that Lacewing zip you downloaded back in episode one, open up the uh, server subdirectory. You should see something like this. You've got a bunch of files here. Run the Lacewing server. You are now on your computer running um, a Lacewing server. And to connect to that, uh, we are going to just type in localhost. Um, unless you know your IP, in which case um, type in that. If you've got localhost here, you send it to uh, an external computer that's outside the network that you're on, then it won't work, so make sure you do have a static IP. Um, so port being the default 6121, unless you've obviously changed that. Um, and once we've connected, we are going to set our name, just like we did for yeah, back in episode 1. So connection on connect is what I want. Uh, set name to username box contents. On name set. Uh, last time we 
uh, where's name? On name set. Um, last time we just went on and joined a channel. We're not going to do that this time. We're just going to move on to the next frame because the channel is going to be uh, selected by the player in this game list. Uh, so yes, let's take a look at these events. So we've already got this one in here. Uh, we're going to probably just have another starter frame to keep things neat. And the very first thing we want to do is request a channel list. We can do that channel list in request list. Um, and when we've got the list of the channels that uh, are available, or the list of matches, you can think about it like that, we then uh, want to loop through all these channels. Very, very similar to the way we looped through the peers, but this time we we'll loop in channels. So we can do um, uh, loop listed channels. That's great. So however many channels there are, the uh, channel list in on loop will run that many times. And on channel list loop, we want to add the line to our list box. So add a line, and the line we want to add is the uh, name of the listed channel. Let's get name. It's right there. There we are. Now, what about creating a game? Let's deal with that first. Uh, we can game name box. Uh, no, we don't. We want to. When yes, button create game. That's what we're doing. And we also want to check for the length of the game name box. So I'm going to compare two general values because we won't want to create a game without any name. That that will oh that could be horrendous, disastrous even. So the length of the uh, game name box, if that's greater than zero the, and the button is pressed, then we want to uh, join the channel. So I can go channel join, and the name of the channel is whatever's in that game name box. And then we remember we've got these extra uh, options we can use. So hide channel from list. Now we're actually using lists a lot, so we certainly don't want to hide this channel from a list. So I'm going to put a zero in this one. Uh, close channel automatically when you leave. Um, for now, we're going to have zero. We might change that in episode three, though. Uh, what about when the player wants to join a game, such as when the uh, join select game button is clicked? Well, we can. Uh, I'm just going to drag this one down, um, but edit it so that instead of whatever's in the game name box, which wouldn't make any sense, we're going to get uh, the current lines text. There we go, and we're going to have zero and zero again. So, what happens when Lace Spring joins to a channel? On join, we just want to move on to the next frame. We want to get into the match as soon as possible. Okay. Oh, and there's one last uh, event we need to put in, and that's what happens when the refresh game list button is clicked. Where's that button? Refresh game list. There we are. And first of all, we need to uh, reset the list, and then we can just rec um, request channel list all over again. Wonderful. Uh, Okay, we should probably just test that to make sure that we connect to our server. I'm going to put the server there, and whoops, not run that. Run the whole application so we get the name, and that actually works. How about that, Matt? Yeah. Okay. And you can see the old server should have some updates that show where the user is connected from, what their name is. That log will just uh, increase to whatever the whatever your peers are doing. Okay, I think that's working. I'm just going to create a a, a game and yes, uh, join join the channel. Blah, wonderful. It seems like it's working fine. I'm going to close it down and we should move on to uh, the next section or rather the next frame. Now in this game frame, we need to keep the other peers synced with how the local player is moving, and we do this by sending messages. And it's worth having a good look over exactly how we're going to do this. And let's think it through. <laughs> you can see either prepared this uh, because I actually have a slideshow here. It's going to be good. This is, we're both, it's going to be mutually enjoyable. Um, so in in this first technique uh, that we could if we wanted to use for updating, now I've called this the safe method although overly cautious or stupid would have worked uh, just as well. And uh, Now every frame uh, in this example we're sending uh, a, a message and that message contains the X position, uh, the Y position and the direction value. And not surprisingly, this is a pretty poor method. We're sending messages uh, way too often, uh, using up a lot of bandwidth, forcing the server to work harder than it should do. Uh, in addition, we're only sending and setting the X and Y positions the moment will appear very 
jerky unless you wrote some interpolation events to uh, to smooth it out but that's that's really way too much work it, and it goes without saying but I will say it anyway don't use this method it, it's it's silly uh, this this method is uh, is a little better um, quite a lot better actually uh, we're going to implement this one uh, in this episode the prudent method method uh, first only sends the message when it needs to in this case when the user starts or uh, starts moving or changes direction you'll see that I've split the updated into horizontal and vertical updates dealing with the up and down keys with the Y speed and the left and right with the the X speed another subtle difference you might have noticed is that send message has changed to blast message uh, what is the difference you know, when should we send a message when should we blast a message now sending a message uh, uses uh, TCP which is a network protocol and blasting a message uses UDP which is a different uh, network uh, protocol TCP messages will always reach their destination eventually and UDP messages occasionally they don't get there at all TCP messages will always be in order or arrive in order and uh, UDP messages uh, occasionally they don't get there in the right order now uh, you're probably looking at this list and uh, these lists and thinking well why would anyone in their right mind use UDP because it all seems so um, well not, nothing's guaranteed uh, I, I don't like the look of it well uh, the, the big advantage for UDP is that the messages are just f so much more lightweight um, if you like that they're, they're faster that's one way to think about it um, now with uh, I've, I've come across too many people I think sort of learning how to use Lacewing who shy away from using uh, blast messages uh, because they, they want every message to get there um, eventually now I can't help but think that that's, that's somewhat uh, too, too safe an approach because most modern games now certainly any modern game in the last seven years has used UDP um, blasting messages if you like uh, for its real-time multiplayer code, and uh, I, I've done a few tests with Lacewing connected to a, um, a public server and sent uh, a couple of UDP messages every second, and only one in 500, 600 uh, has it has failed, uh, which is reasonably good. It's not like one in four messages gets eat eaten by a, a lion on the way. It, it, it's not quite that bad. Um, so we we know now what we're we're sending, or uh, rather, uh, what we're blasting. But how are we sending this data? Here's a method. Um, here you can see I've just substituted the x position for a number, the y position for a number, and the x speed, uh, just for for numbers. So some real values, so we can think about it uh, and give some examples in those terms. Now we could send each little value on uh, on different subchannels, like so, each number on a different subchannel, but not really too satisfied with this um, method because we'll have too many on subchannel received event and if the game ever gets you know it, it sends so many different types of data then we'll run out of subchannels and it'll be too many and yeah you know, generally I don't really like the idea of this that many uh, on message received events here's a better way to do it where we take each of these values we put them in a string and we separate each value by a hash character um, we're, which um, we call this a, a delimiter uh, using the string tokenize extension we can extract these as substrings uh, we can then convert them to values and use them and we only use one subchannel uh, so and then we, what we can then do is we can use uh, a subchannel for every sort of type of update which is far nicer than it for each type of data I hope that kind of makes a bit of sense as to why that's better so finally let's just be sure about all the different update messages that we uh, want to send now the uh, first one is the full update which is sent when a, a peer joins the channel now the peer wants to know uh, wants to immediately know everything about every other player so it's not missing a thing and it's crucial that the player sends these details so for this update and this update alone we're sending it now uh, the next update is the horizontal update I think yes it is well we, we're blasting the X the Y and the X speed on a, on a different subchannel and also uh, there's the vertical which is um, update which is very much the same a different subchannel and we're uh, setting it on the 
Y speed. Now I'm pretty happy with this design. Uh, there are some better ways. We might optimize it in the third episode if we have some time. Um, but let's get back to implementing it then. You'll notice that here in the event editor there is um, an empty group called Lacewing Events. So let's go ahead and fill that. Uh, I'm just going to turn off the create at start properties for both the self object and the peer object because the user, when this frame starts, will just have chosen or created a game. So I'm just going to, as a word, just spawn uh, that self object right in the middle, uh, which I think is uh, 250 and then 175. Okay, we also need to spawn all the other players, all the other peers. So I'm just going to loop through them, just like we did in episode one. And on that particular peer loop, we're going to create a peer object. Uh, but we don't actually know where it is. It could have moved around, or it might be still in the same place as it spawned. We, we can't actually assume anything. So I'm just going to have it created up here in the corner. And we'll worry about this sort of problem a bit later on. Uh, but we also just need to um, set some values for... Uh, that peer object, one being the uh, peer ID. We'll use this later for referencing to the uh, lacewing ID, and we're also going to do the same with the multiple string peer name. Going to set that to selected peer name, like so. What happens though when a peer connects? We can do that with on peer connect. I'm going to add in uh, while I'm there. Uh, on peer disconnect. Well, on peer connect we want to create the peer object. This time though we do know where the user is going to be spawned. Um, in this case it's right in the middle. Uh, exactly the same as the self object. Uh, no different. And it's the same with the setting the values. So I'm just going to drag it down there to copy it. On peer disconnect we just want to uh, destroy the peer, but we can't just leave the condition like this though, because if we had two other players, two peers, and one left, they would both be destroyed. Now, why is that? Well, we're not actually selecting specifically which peer object we want gone. Uh, we can do this by just comparing um, the ultimate value of this uh, peer object, the ultimate value being uh, peer ID, with the lacewing ID of the uh, um, of the the peer that has just disconnected, and that should select just one of these uh, peer objects and destroy it. So that's exactly what we want. Now we should go back and we should deal with this problem of not knowing where the peer objects have moved to when we connect to a game in progress. See, uh, on peer connect we could send our full update, if you remember that, um, to the peer on peer connect. In fact this is actually the best way of doing things, but whilst it works fine when connected to a remote server, like one of the public servers, I can't actually get it working when connected to local host, which I guess makes sense. If we're sending a message to one specific peer, which is what we'll be doing, and that peer is running on the very same machine, then something's going to get confused. I'm not surprised it's not getting through. Uh, so you're going to have to excuse a little work around here. We're just actually going to uh, send a request to the other peers to send us a full update. So it's a little bit of a handshaking thing. So I'm going to do that by, uh, first of all, comparing two general values, one of which is the selected channel number of peers. If that is greater than zero, if there's other people in the channel in the game, we only want this to run just once though, so I'm going to limit the conditions to running this event once. If that's the case, then we're going to send a message on subchannel 0 to channel, send in the text on subchannel 0, and the text we're just going to send is the letter R. Now, just a very, very short message, um, not going to waste any bandwidth. And when we receive this message on text channel message, did we send it on subchannel 0? Yes, we did. I've got a short memory. Okay, and uh, we're going to compare two general values, one of which being the uh, received text. We're just making sure that the received checked. Uh, te text is R, and if that's the case, then we want to send the full update. Let's just remind ourselves what the full update looks like. So we're sending it on subchannel 1, we're going to send it to peer, just the one peer, and we're sending the X position, the Y position, the X speed, the Y speed, and the direction value, all split up with hash characters, all in a string. So let's add that now. Send text to peer on subchannel sub -channel 1, and the text we're going to send is first of all the string, because we need to convert uh, from alterable values just to strings, uh, or just values, sorry. Um, we're going to get the uh, x position. I'm going to add 
uh, a hash, a little hash string on the end there. I'm going to paste that and change it to, so I'm sending the string of the Y position. Add a little hash as well there, send in the uh, X position is next. Oh, I need to convert that to a string, excuse me. And add in another hash. Oh, I keep on forgetting to convert to a string. And changing the X speed to a Y speed. Final hash and also the string of the direction value. Okay, so we, let's just check. Uh, current expression is valid. We've got the X. Uh, position, the Y position, the X speed, the Y speed and also the direction. That's exactly what we want. So I'm happy sending that off. So let's actually use this now, shall we? Shall we um, uh, test to see whether we uh, have received this message? So message sent on text peer message on subchannel 0. Can you all forget him? What? Oh, we're sending it on subchannel 1. Excuse me. Subchannel 1. So the first thing we want to do is hand that string over to our string tokenizer object to split it up, and the string we want is the received text. And the delimiters is, of course, that hash value, which I've typed in about, I don't know, 10 times by now. Now we've given it the string tokenizer object to split up, we can actually just use these values by setting the, let's start off with the X position. We set the X position to the value, because remember we need to convert it from string to value. Uh, the value of the element, uh, the first one will be 0. Uh, index 0, I'm going to copy and paste that into the Y coordinate and change the index to 1. And same with X speed, but changing it to 2. And setting the Y speed with the index 3. And finally, we're going to set the direction to index Four. Wonderful. I'm just going to check that by looking them down. Zero, one, two, three, four. Those are all the indexes we want. Well, of course, we are setting um, uh, details of a peer object, so we want to make sure we're selecting the right object. We can't. We don't want to be setting any old object or all of them, rather. So I'm going to add that down here just to make sure we're selecting the right object. So now we're de we, we've dealt with the full update, what about if we receive uh, a horizontal update, which, if we look at our plan, is when we uh, receive some blast text on subchannel 0. So I'm going to check for blasted text, channel message, subchannel 0, and we are going to hand over the message to the string pass object, and we are going to set uh, X position, I think I've still got it on the clipboard, yes I do. I'm just going to paste that in. I'm going to set the Y position to index 1. And we're also going to set the X speed, because this is the horizontal update, to number 2. Uh, 0, 1, 2, that should work fine. We also need to keep selecting the right object. We, you know, So many bugs come because of um, not selecting the right object, it's just good to keep on checking. I'm going to copy and paste the whole thing because the Y, um, the up and down, the Y the vertical update, sorry, is uh, exactly the same except we uh, change the Y speed and we also change the subchannel. So first of all, change the subchannel to be 1 and we are changing that X speed value, changing that to Y speed. There we are. And that should work fine. We're selecting it, the right object, so that's good. We're not actually sending these um, messages yet, uh, so perhaps we should do that. I think we should. Uh, first of all, I think there's one last thing um, to do with when we're receiving messages, and that's to do with this debugging string we've got going on there. It's always helpful as developers to make sure we are sending the right objects, uh, right, right um, messages. So I'm going to do a message on. Uh, text peer message on any subchannel in addition to a uh, message blasted on text channel message on any subchannel. This is by adding minus one. You see how it says minus one for any up there. It's very useful. We're just going to set the or rather change the alterable value to whatever uh, text we've received. I drag that down there. So we can always see down at the bottom of the screen the last message we have received in any of the methods that we've been using, which is very helpful um, when we need to debug. So let's actually send this uh, X um, update and this Y update, because we actually haven't done that yet. 
Um, I might just split this up. I don't usually comment while I'm recording, but I might just split this up. So we, this is just looking very busy now. I'm unsure of what I've done. So let's go X uh, updating. There we are. Okay. Now uh, we want to send the message whenever um, for X updating whenever the player has hit the uh, right button or the left button. Let's deal with the right button to begin with. We can do this by comparing the joystick, repeat while joystick pressed right, and we also need inserting limit condition only one event loops. Now this is actually exactly the same to read in joystick state that, but the reason why we have to use this method is because um, when you have this sort of red uh, immediate condition that will be th this will run before we actually set the x and the y speed which is certainly not what we want so we have to use this method um, and so when uh, these conditions are are satisfied when the, the user hits the right button we want to send a message, we want to blast a message rather we're blasting text to channel subchannel 0 because it's a horizontal update and the text to blast is the string of the x uh, there it is, x position and I copy that one, whoops uh, add in a hash key character uh, change the x to the y, add in another hash character, whoops making so many mistakes now. I've been doing this for an hour, so or however long I've been recording, I don't know. I, I'm, it's good that I'm recording though, because I'm recording my descent into madness. Uh, I'm sure it's entertaining for you. And the final thing is the string <laughs> of the X speed. I think that's right, yes. I'm going to copy and paste this entire event, changing uh, the direction of the joystick action to the left, and that should be exactly the same, and no need to change that because we're changing the X position, X speed rather, um, up top in the previous events. What happens when the uh, player is no longer hitting either the right or the, le uh, or the left key? Uh, we need to again send this message. So I'm going to copy and paste this. I'm going to move the right, um, the you know, moved right condition in here. I'm going to negate both of these, and there we go. Again, sending that same message. I'm just going to copy and paste this. <laughs> Um, condition, uh, change that to Y, keeping things nice and neat uh, in my OCD kind of nature. Now I'm going to copy and paste all of these and change it so we're actually sending a Y message. So repeat one where the joystick is going up or top and bottom as well down here. I'm just going to replace these, negate those and we need to edit this message that we're sending. We need to first of all send it on subchannel 1 and we need to change the X speed to the Y speed. And I am going to drag those down there like so. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, we are finished. I'm going to save that. I am going to build the application. I'll overwrite this old one. Wonderful. Now here's the question will this work? I've still got my server running here and oh I'm nervous, I probably made a mistake and I have to do the whole recording again wouldn't that be sad? okay so I'll just enter some names, this is the first time I've tried this so Matt um, again start impersonating people oh, that'll do. okay so I'm gonna have one person uh, create a game uh -huh. and move them down there. I'm going to refresh the game list and yes it has appeared, that's great, let's join that. Oh, oh yeah this is looking good, I'm I'm amazing, uh, or not, oh gosh. Uh, and let's just check that this works, oh look at that, this, this is one, this is an exciting game isn't it? There's no shooting or anything yet, maybe we'll add that in the third episode, wouldn't that be fun? But obviously, remember how, look at, look at how the um, the debugging string is changing, we can see how we're sending them. Uh, there don't, doesn't seem any need to be debugging, because look, it's all working wonderful. But what, ha what happens when we uh, leave? Yes, we are um, deleting the right, um, the right objects. So there we go. That is episode two over with. I hope you've had fun. We've uh, we've learned how to create a movement. We've learned how to send messages uh, using that string tokenizer object. We can split apart those messages, get at the those tasty substrings inside. 
Um, so do come back, join us for episode 3, we might have a look at optimising this movement that we've created and we'll add of course the shooting which, uh, which should be fun. So I've been Matt, thanks for watching, see you again soon.